Today, we will study the circle. We will view the circle as the real locus defined by the polynomial equation x squared plus y squared equals 1. Now, the polynomial seems to know a little bit more than the real circle that you have in mind and uh, that you have been studying since the middle school because I can plug in different kinds of quantities in place of x and y instead of real numbers. As long as addition, multiplication and equality with 1 make sense, I can do this. And then the problem of understanding the locus of quantities x and y that satisfy the polynomial equation x squared plus y squared equals 1 uh, is a slightly different problem. Each of these problems are interrelated. The techniques uh, inform one another, so as do the results. And uh, this is a key idea in algebraic geometry, that you would study polynomial equations and their geometry by changing uh, fields, or changing the base rings, the quantities at which you evaluate the polynomials. And this is especially important when you are doing computational algebraic geometry, because the computer does not understand uh, fields like complex numbers and real numbers very well. You have to give it finite representable objects like rational numbers or finite fields. And so you need to understand how you can carry information from one side into the other. Carry your geometric intuition from the complex and real side, the more arithmetic side, and then interpret the answer that the computer tells you to feed back into your geometric intuition. All right, so we will do this now in the case of a circle. Let's begin with the real circle. The real circle I will denote uh, as C of R. C I'm thinking of my circle or even as my polynomial equation and C of R are its real solutions. So it's tuples x and y in R2 such that x squared plus y squared equals 1. <clears throat> and of course uh, we've been studying this since middle school so let me draw a picture or two and then call it a day. So this is the real circle and of course it's a, in fact a fundamental object and it's very very interesting but probably you've heard enough about it so I won't elaborate too much except to remind you that uh, this is the source one way uh, at least to generate the functions cosine theta sine theta so if you go an arc length theta then the x y coordinates on this circle are called cosine theta and sine theta and this is one way to define these two functions. In addition, pi is the area of this unit circle and so on. Well cl clearly this is very interesting but we know enough about it so let's move on. Now let's talk about the complex circle. So that's the set of solutions C, C. Um, these are tuples x, y in C2, so the complex plane, such that x squared plus y squared equals 1. An interesting feature about this is that clearly this lives in C2, which of course is uh, four dimensional from a real point of view. So this this is um, way too many dimensions for me to plot it correctly. But we can try. <coughs> First of all, let's just uh, start by drawing the x-axis. So this is the complex x-axis, meaning the set x0 or x in the complex numbers. 
that will, for instance, be the real x-axis lying inside. Let me plot this as this black line. It's the real x-axis. So here's what we're going to do instead. y squared equals 1 minus x squared. Now informally one could say this is means y is plus or minus 1 minus square root of 1 minus x squared. But um, this is not quite good enough. It doesn't capture everything. Uh, let's first let's get what we can out of this. For each x that's not plus or minus one for every complex number, uh, there exists two roots of one minus x squared over the complex numbers. So this is different from the real circle, where I could only plug in values of x between minus one and one. This time any value of x will do, and there will be two values of y satisfying this equation. And for x equals to plus or minus 1, there exists only one, namely y equals 0. <clears throat> so let's try to draw a picture of this circle without an embedding into C2, uh, just from this uh, fact alone. It means that for every value of x that I choose, there should be two values of y, uh, let's say, above and below. Now if I were to do this for every point here, I should get two copies of the x-plane. So this is sheet one, this is sheet two. In some sense, these are the square roots, uh, and these are the two sheets of the square root, the plus sign and the minus sign, so to speak. But we know something, that there are these two important points, minus one and plus one. Here, I should have only one value of y, not two, uh, because of the inside the square root I get zero, meaning that this point and that point should be glued together and similarly this point and this point should be glued together. And of course I already see my real circle here it, for values of x lying between minus one and one I get these two copies of the interval but the ends of these two intervals will be glued together and then I get my real circle. But let me delete this real circle for now. I'm going to do something else. To really understand the geometry of the, uh, how these sheets come together, um, let's study what happens as I go around 1 and minus 1. For example, if I were to st start somewhere here, so if I went around 1 like this, What would happen if I were to do a holomorphic continuation of the square root function 1 minus x squared? So I want to understand what happens to the y coordinates as I try to walk on my complex circle, if you will. So what happens is that I'm going to start here, so I chose that square root, and then I follow along. Now, to make sense out of this, so I've gone only halfway. Afterwards, I want to say that I will jump to the second sheet and then come back to the uh, other square root of the point that I started with. That I would like to say that there's one to draw a line here and that I should, whenever I cross this line, I switch a sheet. So let's explain uh, why it should be so. For example, so write x equals 1 plus u with u being small, so smaller than 1 will be enough, u is a complex number. For example, uh, I'm trying to parameterize the orange loop. Then y will be 
the square root of u times minus 2 minus u squared, <coughs> expanding out 1 minus x squared. So this in particular, I will absorb now the sign change as the square root of u, this is a multi-valued function, times the square root minus 2 minus u. The point being that since u is small, this expression can be well defined. Minus 2 minus u will never uh, approach 0, it will not go around it. So that I can define, I can choose a branch so that this square root is well defined uh, in the disk u is smaller than 1. But the other square root function, this is multivalued. And what I do with holomorphic continuation is that I start at some point, let's say and then uh, just change the angle without, while preserving the radius. And then I change the angle theta from 0 to 2 pi. What that will do is give me this orange curve, uh, but for the square root function, what's going to happen is that even though u came back to its starting value, its square root, uh, having acquired an extra angle of pi, will change psi. So that's, uh, that's why if I choose my, the branch for the square root function appropriately, uh, you'll see that I'm, this explains how I'm changing from one sheet of the square root function to the other. And of course the same analysis around minus one will give you a similar observation. If I were to start here and go around, I'd find myself coming back here. Okay, so let's now complete the picture. We, this, this gives us an understanding of the geometry of how these two sheets should come together. Uh, but this is not a, my favorite way to visualize this. So now let's uh, relax a little bit and use a slightly more topological argument to put these two sh sheets together. So to glue them appropriately to reflect this um, warping behavior as we pass through the, this dotted portal that I drew between the stars. Now let me draw my two sheets of uh, the x-axis once again. And mark my four special points, the copies of plus and minus one, remembering that they will have to join together. And there was this issue uh, about having a portal in between those two points whereby I'm supposed to be able to pass from one sheet onto the other. One way to do it is to imagine these uh, two uh, sheets as rubber sheets and what I'm going to do is uh, to cut along these dotted lines and then I'm going to put my hands through it and pull the two ends together. So let me draw what happens. Now I get a lip here and a lip here. And you'll notice that uh, for each of these pairs of lips I've drawn uh, one lip with a dotted line and one of them without because what I want to do is to still uh, keep the number of points the same so to speak. So this I've cut it along, uh, essentially along the points corresponding to my real circle and um, this is the top sheet while well, I have only one line segment corresponding to this uh, circle. I don't want to duplicate uh, the number of copies of my real circle. And this is here I'm drawing by shading now to denote that it's just the 
gaping void. There's nothing there. And remember, the idea is that if I go like this, I need to come around like that. Well, okay, uh, let's continue now. This time I'm going to take uh, the two ends of these uh, lips together and then pull it out of these sheets. So it's a rubber sheet, so it's going to come as I pull, and I'm going to do it on both sides. Okay, so the two ends are about to meet. Let me draw these two ends now. <clears throat> and you can already see the shape that's about to form. These two ends must be glued together to form my real circle, in fact, and then the rest is my complex circle. Let me finish the picture. So what we are going to get My complex circle looks like a cylinder. So of course these two ends, uh, the two planes that I've drawn, they're infinite. So uh, geometrically this is an infinite cylinder with the two open ends going to infinity. Moreover, the way I've constructed it, my real circle is lying here at the neck. So one interesting fact here is that my real circle ends up being the generator of the homology group for this complex curve. So it's the loop of the cylinder that is my complex circle. One thing you can ask yourself at this point is that what would be the relation in general of the solutions to polynomial sets? if I consider the solutions over the real numbers versus the complex numbers? And uh, in general, this is an extremely open question. Even for dimension one, which is what we are considering here, the problem was um, posed essentially by Hilbert. So this is known as uh, one interpretation of Hilbert's 16th problem. And what you see here, that the real part is the generator of the homology is the best possible answer. It doesn't always work like this, it's much more complicated in general. But you see here one of the best instances of this open problem. That's it uh, about the complex circle. The techniques that I've just introduced to you can be applied verbatim to more complicated curves, in particular to hyperelliptic curves, and you can study pretty much any plane curve so something that's defined by a single equation into variables x and y in the plane, although uh, you'd have to think a little bit more about it. Now, next up, we're going to study more arithmetic properties of the circle, starting with the rational circle, or the rational points on the circle. See you then.